To understand the bifurcations of the two-dimensional planar systems, everything begins at the Jacob Jacobian matrix uh, of uh, our system. Um, so the linearization at the equilibria, because close to the equilibria, we will get the eigenvalues that will tell us what is the dire direction of the flow at the equilibria. So if you have uh, positive eigenvalues, you will have an expanding flow. If you have negative eigenvalues, you will have a contracting flow. And if you have a mixture of positive and uh, negative values, you have a flow that contracts in some directions and expands in other directions, hence being a saddle node. The Unreal eigenvalues uh, create rotating flows, so imaginary eigenvalues uh, associate generally with rotation. And basically everything fits in these... Uh, how many classes are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight classes. Um, you can find a very thorough discussion of these topological equivalence classes in the Dynamics and Bifurcations book. Uh, but you can see here that if you have two negative eigenvalues, you have a contracting flow, uh, two positive expanding flow, a mixture of the two, you have the saddle node, or a rotating flow if you have the eigenvalues in the, uh, not in the main diagonal, but in the, in the secondary diagonal. If you have only one, uh, eigen, one of the eigenvalues zero and the other eigenvalue is uh, a positive number, you have an expanding flow in one direction and no change in the other direction. Note as well that the representation of these linearizations of the Jacobian matrix are in Jordan normal form. Uh, so it's a minimal representation. The qualitative behavior of the flows close to the equilibrium will not change by scalings of these uh, of these coefficients. Another way to look into this is by solving the uh, linear system uh, with the Jordan normal form as we just had it, and you will see that the roots of the characteristic equation, that's the solution for the linear system, uh, in terms of the, uh, their eigenvalues, uh, can inform us about the flow in the exact same way, so by, by isolating uh, the, the same classes. Here we are not having the, uh, the constant classes, only the, the ones with, um, with non-constant flows. But you can see there that uh, if you have complex roots and neg negative real parts, uh, you have a spiraling in. If you have uh, only real roots, they're negative, they're all converging uh, linearly. Uh, if you have uh, the roots with different uh, um, real parts, positive or negative, uh, you have a saddle node. Uh, if you have both positive, uh, they are, it's an expanding flow. Uh, and here, if, if they are both uh, positive, they're expanding, but uh, since they have an imaginary part, they're also rotating. Now, you can think about all that can happen with bifurcations as uh, we progress uh, in this space of eigenvalues and change them uh, into each other's. And they basically will exhaust all the possibilities uh, for generic bifurcations. And this is a lovely picture about, uh, from Wikipedia that uh, tells us how the uh, changes of these eigenvalues in the linear system uh, change the local flows close to equilibria. So here we imagine that we have the linearization of our Jacobian uh, and uh, we have two equations, ax plus by, cx dy. Um, then P is the trace, uh, which is A plus D. Q is the determinant, which is AD minus BC. And delta indicates whether uh, the characteristic equation has uh, imaginary roots or not. So you see here the delta separates the rotating flows from the non-rotating flows. When delta is positive, the flows are not rotating. When delta is negative, the flows are rotating. When we go through them, uh, the characteristic equation acquired imaginary. We also see that when P is positive, that is the trace is positive, that is our eigenvalues are uh, both positive. 
uh, that you have expanding flows, whereas if P is negative, you have contracting flows. That's for linear systems. For nonlinear systems, the picture is a little bit more complicated, but it's based on combinations of these linear uh, characteristics of the planar flows. Let us build a little bit of an intuition about what happens to these planar flows with a good example, the Fitzsug-Nagumo model that uh, can do so many things, represents uh, heart cells, represents neurons, represents uh, the flows in the bilozov zabczynski reaction has been used also to, uh, to explain dictyostelium behavior. Uh, and here F of V is a cubic and you can see it in the shape uh, of uh, the V nocline. And I wanted to use this system to build a little bit uh, of an intuition uh, about the kinds of things that can happen. Particularly, we're going to go through the Hopf bifurcation here. So the endron of Hopf bifurcation, or Hopf bifurcation for short, happens when a couple of eigenvalues lose their, uh, lose their real parts and have only imaginary roots. That is, we change from an uh, expanding or contracting flow to a flow that rotates around the equilibrium. So I've decided to show you this uh, mathematical demonstration of the Fitzhugh-Nagumo model so that you can see the changes of the uh, vector field as we change a couple of parameters indicating uh, certain contributions to the flow of the input current and how that changes a dampened oscillator here. Uh, so this is the orbit of the Fitzhugh-Nagumo. You have in the x uh, you have uh, the equivalent of membrane potential in y you have the equivalent of a certain refractory variable i'm going to go through this in the next lecture for, with a little bit more detail um, but what you see here is that uh, for these uh, this cubic uh, and this uh, linear uh, function here we have a global attractor uh, at this equilibrium here. So you know that this in this equilibrium you have a little bit of a rotating thing going on. Uh, so you probably have a little bit of, uh, of imaginary uh, eigenvalues. Uh, but you also have a little bit of a real part since it is contracting. That real part is negative for both uh, eigenvalues. As you raise the input current, you observe what is called the canard very quickly at very small changes of current you notice that you uh, that equilibrium changes uh, changes aspect very quickly so it goes from here to having a very long oscillating transient uh, to when it explodes into a spike and so you saw the, the bifurcation happens very quickly and is, is very catastrophic uh, and you start seeing some spikes here in orange so that is the, uh, the membrane potential and the, this is the refractory variable so you have this two-dimensional uh, flow. If you continue to uh, increase the input current uh, you will eventually here find a saturation at the depolarized state. So this is the equivalent of injecting too much current in the cell. And I will leave you to see when that happens. And so mathematically gets a little slow when, when I'm recording. But you see here uh, that the middle branch of the cubic is the unstable branch. And the, uh, the left and the right branches of the cubic, so these uh, here, they're the stable branches. So in these stable branches, the equilibrium is all attracting. And uh, if you have here, uh, uh, you pass the Hopf bifurcation in, the, uh, in this middle branch. Now there's one more interesting thing that can happen here in the system uh, is hysteresis. So if you go through a pitchfork bifurcation here at this parameter b here or parameter c in fact you can uh, you can change the slope of the refractory variable and if you change the slope such that you get 
three intersections with the cubic, two in the stable branches. You and one have now three equilibria, branch. one that is unstable here in the middle, and two that are stable on the top and on the bottom. So you also have a little bit of hysteresis because I can move around here and remain in that equilibrium until we change the membrane potential. And so you have a little bit of a memory thing going on. Like if you remember the hysteresis loop, this should make sense to you. Uh, we continue to go into this uh, equilibrium uh, for a, a little while. And so here you have the pitchfork bifurcation and hence uh, the emergence of the hysteresis effect, the same hysteresis effect as we saw in one dimension. That is, uh, we have a little bit of a memory to small perturbations of the parameter. That's what I wanted to tell you about the Fitzgerald. So you saw the emergence of a hop bifurcation uh, and uh, the, also the emergence of what is called a canard, C-A-N-A-R-D, which is this very quick transition from a fixed point orbit uh, that's spiraling in uh, to this very large cycle. And along with the hysteresis in the Fitzsugnagumu, we saw that we have the Hopf bifurcation, of which this is a so called normal form. So, this is the uh, a very concise way of expressing the this particular kind of bifurcation. And uh, it can be then shown that uh, many other systems display the same Hopf bifurcation uh, topologically equivalently. So there are transformations that take any Hopf bifurcation in any system to any other uh, Hopf bifurcation. Let's see what is happening with the Hopf bifurcation in this uh, in the space of all possible bifurcations. The Andronov hop is here. Uh, it is changing the delta, which in this plot represents the determinant of the equation. And you see here what's happening with the eigenvalues. So in this case, they're real. A part is positive and they have an imaginary part, so they're spiraling out. And here they are spiraling in because the real part is negative and they have imaginaries. So exactly at this line, we have then the formation of a circle around. Uh, and so we're having neither attracting nor repelling orbits. And that is what forms the andronov hopf limit cycle, or limit cycle for short. So a limit cycle is when the orbits are neither attracted nor repelled by a certain equilibrium. And this is valid similarly for all of the other relationships between the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And this is how you can read all of this bifurcation space. I hope now this makes better sense to you uh, when we talk about all the kinds of bifurcations and the classes of generic bifurcations in planar systems. This is the image that should be underlying your understanding. Now, obviously, this is only for linear linearizations of the system. But locally, close to equilibria, this is an exhaustive picture. When we have nonlinearities in the system, we also have all of these bifurcations, only that they happen uh, as the flows can be contracted uh, and, uh, and expanding depending on the, inter uh, the interaction between the equilibria, which we didn't see in that uh, picture. In that picture, we only see what happens locally at the equilibria, but most of the interesting things in planar systems happen when equilibria interact. Uh, the local uh, near equilibria, we have uh, here the saddle node and uh, the end of Hopf bifurcation that you just uh, can glance uh, over the uh, that slide we just showed with the space of all local bifurcations. And we also have here the global bifurcations, which are the local of cycles and bifurcations of homoclinic and heteroclinic orbits. I'm going to go through them uh, in a qualitative fashion. So here we have the normal form for a fold and a settle node, that is when we have uh, the emergence of a stable equilibrium and the unstable equilibrium uh, at the control of a parameter. Uh, 
Uh, so that's equivalent to what happens in one dimension, that's the local one. The same thing happened with the andronov hopf bifurcation, this is a different way to express it. Uh, we just saw the normal form a couple of slides ago, uh, that it, it's not in a polar uh, fashion, this is in a polar fashion. I'm not going to get into the supercritical and subcritical uh, versions of that. You just you have to understand that we have the emergence of a limit cycle at the loss of the real parts of the eigenvalues locally close to the equilibrium. Next we have the cyclic fold which is when we see two limit cycles interacting. So it's possible to uh, have limit cycles interacting and here we have a C2 which is a stable cycle when a C1 there's an unstable cycle you can see the representations of the flows nearby and uh, you also have uh, the parameter which is changing them making an embedded stable cycle grow uh, and a uh, the outer unstable cycle shrink uh, until they meet each other and explode into a in this case like a positive eigenvalue in the equilibrium uh, positive real parts when beta is larger than zero you can see there's a similarity and there's a way in which you can analyze this by reducing the uh, the parameter to one dimension and this whole equation to one dimension this is uh, via the implicit function theorem but it doesn't uh, it's not uh, it doesn't concern us here and here's another way in which equilibria can interact here we have uh, a two saddle nodes interacting notes notice that we have uh, for beta is smaller than zero, we have the so-called unstable manifold of the saddle exiting from the equilibrium, but not quite going, that orbit is not quite going to the other equilibrium um, yet. If you uh, control parameter beta such that the stable manifold, uh, the one uh, from the right size uh, equilibrium which is converging uh, meets the unstable from the left saddle node equilibrium uh, and then you see that you have the uh, the orbit that connects the two equilibria this is called a heteroclinic orbit because it's going from one equilibrium to another equilibrium another kind is the homoclinic orbit corresponding homoclinic bifurcation in which you have orbits leaving from one uh, equilibrium and arriving at the exact same equilibrium. This is interesting because uh, you can uh, this emerges also in the, when you have a saddle node and the orbits of that saddle node, the uh, manifold, stable manifold and unstable manifold of the saddle node meet as a function of the parameter. Here we have uh, in the bottom what happens as you change parameter mu in this case and, and you see that you have an open cycle that is uh, converging uh, to an equilibrium so, uh, then you have these two cycles meeting which also uh, form uh, a limit cycle that is enclosed in the homoclinic orbit, homoclinic orbit going from the same uh, equilibrium and returning to the same equilibrium uh, and eventually exploding into again a uh, an unstable equilibrium that now flows into the saddle. This is basically and the interaction of two equilibria, a saddle node then interacts with what used to be a stable equilibrium and becomes unstable. Through that process we have the crossing of the stable and unstable manifolds. So this is the so-called homoclinic, uh, homoclinic bifurcation. And look at how interesting this also happens. So this is like the saddle connection that we saw earlier in which we had the two the stable manifold and the unstable manifold of the saddle connecting. 
uh, here you have this happening, only that these two equilibria happen already to be in a loop. Uh, and so this is about the emergence of the uh, loop uh, or the limit cycle at the joining of uh, the, the unstable manifold of one saddle with the stable manifold of the attracting fixed point. So here the, this is the interaction between two equilibria and attracting equilibrium and a saddle and they happen to be on a loop. Uh, very loopy this. Uh, it's, uh, this is uh, the most complex that they can get and now we have covered all the space of general bifurcations that can happen in a planar system. Many combinations are possible and things can get uh, rather complex, but if you look at it uh, locally and you break the phase space into pieces, uh, this is the, more, the most complex that they, can, uh, that they can get. So basically this is the vocabulary of bifurcations in planar systems. And the nice thing is that they are also super useful for, uh, for higher dimensions. And you ca in case you had forgotten uh, all about stable and unstable manifolds, I mentioned them in the context of maps. Uh, the stable, uh, these are uh, the stable and unstable manifolds of a saddle, for instance, here in the top. And you can see that there are orbits being attracted to the saddle. Uh, and in order for them to land the saddle, they need to be at the stable manifold of the saddle. Uh, and uh, the orbits that are moving away from the saddle are in the unstable manifold of the saddle. So this you have to understand what are these uh, manifolds are in order to understand the connections between the flows uh, of, the, of the distinct equilibria. And here finally we get to the end uh, of this presentation on generic bifurcations in planar systems uh, with the image uh, where we got stuck last time because uh, you asked me very rightfully what are these, what's happening at, uh, uh, at each of them and I think that now you can see each row has a parameter uh, in the first case we have uh, the emergence of a saddle, so this is the fold bifurcation, and the second one we have the saddle on a loop. Uh, then we have the emergence of a hop bifurcation, uh, as we saw also in Fitsugna Gumo, that is a supercritical hop. Then we had the uh, we did not see uh, so this uh, this other bifurcation is also a hop bifurcation. It's a supercritical. Then we have a homoclinic loop, and then we have the saddle connection. Uh, and I hope that uh, with this now we have covered all of them. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to know exactly the name of which. I just wanted you to have uh, a, f or a global view of the kinds of things that can happen in planar systems. And this finally uh, are the references uh, that I used for the lecture today. If you have questions remaining, go to the tutorial. We are also going to discuss this uh, in the coming lectures uh, multiple times. And, uh, you know, have fun bifurcating. <laughs>